here because I'm going to go. I'm going to pass it to you. I'm just going to pass it to you. Is that, is that okay? Beginning, uh, I mean, at, 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 my, at the end, I, what I'm doing is uh, um, I'm passing it to Neil Patterson, um, and then after Neil, if time permitting, I would like Peter Morrison to follow up after Neil with a quick informational session on the Worcester Poly Tech Institute study regarding the Antarctic Fire Department emergency response. Should I take that yeah, off? Take that out. Take it out. And just what you should do is just sort of when you say and just say uh, act as though you're just trying to. Is a, they used seven years of information of call yeah. data, right? Because I put that in. I said they put several months and seven years yeah. of call data, okay? So Neil will be able to cut yeah. through. Yeah. Yeah. probably move this chair and take this yeah. one here yeah, because yeah. I don't think we need it. Um, all right, Peter. Yeah, let me give you a so you know where we're going. This is the fact sheet that I put together also, which you can play off of if you want. You know, you can refer to that and say, you know, as the fact sheet shows you, um, or it's stated in the fact sheet, blah, blah, blah. I tried to, see, this is the thing that I told you.
Yeah, maybe Dave and I can switch to yeah. spots. No, because then people might think he's in charge. So. No, no, no. I don't want to be in charge. The governor has oh, closed stop. the doors. Oh, stop. Cut it. That's a big <laughs> What do you want from me? Well, I'm hoping he can get his mind changed quickly. Testing. Things get. So you don't even have money more to be. Oh, you've got the phone. So uh, are we uh, on for tomorrow, or are we going to? Well, yeah. OK. So we have Alan, where are you sitting? Uh, I'm just, just going to do the for about 45 seconds. Oh, you are? OK. Just for just for a few seconds, about thirty-five seconds, and then I'm going to die. Testing, testing. <laughs> okay, Peter, are you but ready? Do you have to get close to the mics, or is it just? <laughs> you don't think? Thanks for the help. There you go. Oh, I think you have one. Yet. Is that loud enough? I want to sit over here as the moderator. Okay, yeah, as that, you should. That's what I thought. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> and away we go. Good afternoon. I'm Alan Reinhardt, president of the Nantucket Civic League. It's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the Nantucket Civic League's forum, Investing in Nantucket's Future, Planning for, uh, I'm sorry, Planning for, let's, let's, let's retake this again. I'm sorry about the sloppy introduction. Uh, we, we are taping this, uh, by the way. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm Alan Reinhardt, President of the Nantucket Civic League. It's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the Nantucket Civic League's Forum, Investing in Nantucket's Future, presenting the case for the new elementary school and the new fire station that will be on the annual town meeting uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, the annual town meeting uh, this April. Part of the purpose of the Civic League is to um, educate the public and to encourage public participation in local island uh, government. Today's forum is uh, one way that we fulfill this purpose. You will hear representatives from the school making the case for the new elementary school that uh, is needed and for the new fire station. On February 23rd, we will have a second portion of this uh, forum series. It will deal with ways that these two major capital projects might be financed and also we'll discuss uh, some of the what will happen um, or some of the issues around doing nothing. There will be a time for questions. 
Uh, we will have people in, um, in the audience who will be coming around with cards. If you have a question for any of the speakers, just write it on the back of a card and we'll get it to them. The, um, and let me introduce Peter Morrison, Vice President of the Civic League, who will be moderating, today, moderating today's event. Peter? Thank you, Alan. And Dr. Leppery, we have a place for you right here if you want to come down here. We'll seat you right here. And I will move over to the moderator's seat. Welcome, everyone. I would like to uh, welcome you on uh, the tropical island of Nantucket to our first forum on investing in Nantucket's future. I'm Peter Morrison, your moderator today, and uh, the Civic League, uh, just by way of a little advertisement, hosts today's forum as part of its mission to promote the general welfare of Nantucket through informed citizen participation in community affairs. And uh, the League uh, actually represents 22 neighborhood area associations, and we have over 1,900 dues-paying families. So today's program is designed to inform you, today's attendees, and the many more voters who will view subsequent rebroadcasts on Channel 18. And I don't know the exact schedule, but it will be broadcast repeatedly. This first forum focuses on why a new fire station and a new school are needed. For each topic, the presenters listed on the program, uh, which are available at the back of the room, the blue uh, handout, um, <clears throat> will offer their perspectives on this question of why. I will then open it up to them to uh, address your written questions from the audience. And the way we'd like to work that to economize on time is if you have a question, raise your hand and someone will come by with a pencil and a note card and you can write your uh, question out. It will be brought down to me. You can put your name on if you want. And I'll sort through the cards and try to direct them to the appropriate person on the panel to uh, give you an answer. Our first topic is the proposed new fire station, and we'll hear first from our town manager, Libby Gibson, who is going to tell you something about both of these major capital programs. Uh, before we go on to Chief McDougall to offer his perspective on the fire station. Libby? Thank you very much, Peter. I think what you mean by that is the procedural details of how yes, these things get yes. through the process. Both projects have already gone through the Capital Program Committee review process, which basically means that they have completed a form which explains the project, gone before the committee more than once on both occasions, and explained the need for the project, the details of the project, how big it is, what its expected cost is, things of that nature. Both projects are recommended by the Capital Program Committee. Both projects have also been reviewed by the Board of Selectmen. In the case of the school project, the Board doesn't necessarily have a role in endorsing or not endorsing it. The fire station project the board basically has endorsed. The next, and the projects have both also gone to the finance committee. They are both warrant articles on the 2015 annual town meeting warrant, which starts April, Monday, April 6th, by the way. They are, if I'm recalling correctly, I believe they are articles 11 and 12. Both are written in a manner that will require debt exclusions at a subsequent election following the town meeting. So they will have to be approved at town meeting in order to be validly considered on the election ballot, which is on Tuesday, April 14th. So that's sort of the procedural aspect of things. And I believe they both require a two-thirds vote for a debt exclusion at town meeting. As far as why the project of the fire station, in any case, um, is needed. I'll leave the school to the superintendent, although I would certainly support that project as well. Um, the fire station project has been in the planning phase for quite some time now, years now. It was, if anybody recalls, supposed to be part of this project. 
However, it was viewed as a, a large project, um, very expensive, and the board decided to take another look at it, established a committee to review it. The committee recommended that the project be broken into two phases, the police station phase and the fire station phase, both phases, though, happening here on this property. So that's pretty much what's happened, and that's where we are, and I guess in the town administration's opinion, it's time to get on to phase two now. There was all, has also been a concern over the last couple of years that the town hasn't had a proper long-term capital financing plan. So we've worked hard over the past year and a half to get such a plan together. We have done so. It will require pretty much annual updating, but that has also been reviewed by the Capital Program Committee, the Board of Selectmen, and the Finance Committee. And that plan will continue to be updated, but the idea is to mitigate the tax impact on the taxpayer so that there aren't large projects happening all at one time. They're um, spread out a little bit and tr tried to be timed so that they come in as other debt in the town is retiring. Um, there are some smoothing techniques that can potentially be used, and we've heard a lot about that at the Capital Program Committee level. I don't know if I should mention anything about the tax rate impact. I did send around some information from the assessor on this um, not very long ago. And the um, I guess since I sort of sent it around to a lot of different people, I'm, I'm going to mention it, although I should qualify it by saying that the numbers have changed since a little bit, since we um, had the assessor prepare these numbers. So the fire station project is estimated to cost $15 million. If we assume borrowing at 5.5% for 20 years, which possibly might be a little high or conservative, the project would, the, the uh, payback of the debt would begin in fiscal year 2019. It would ultimately cost the taxpayer who has a $1 million assessed value property uh, with a tax bill of $3,670, $60 annually. And that is going to change a little bit as we actually know what the debt service will ultimately cost. But that probably is a little bit of a high number. The school project, and I, I know the number has changed now, we did a, a um, an assumption of $47 million, so it's gotten a little better since then even. Same borrowing, 20 years at 5.5% with the payback to begin in fiscal 19. That would cost the taxpayer with an assessed valued property of $1 million. Um, a tax bill, their tax bill would be $3,790. And their tax, their increase in their tax would be $180. I'm wondering at this moment why the 3,600 number and the 3,700 number are different. Is that because of the um, residential exemption, possibly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what it is. In any case, those are basically the numbers. And they are going to change a little bit because the school number is now a little different. And those are assumptions with the um, interest. In the Thank you, Libby. <clears throat> so if I understand it correctly, we're talking about a tax rate increase in very rough terms of 100, uh, one, $100 or $200, not $1,000, uh, for this kind of an investment, given the ingenuity of how it gets financed. Next, I'm going to call on uh, Fire Chief Mark McDougall to offer his perspective. We're starting with the new fire station. And again, let me remind you, if you have questions, mark them. Uh, raise your hand. We'll take them at, uh, at the end of the session. Mark? Great. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> I'd like to thank everyone for uh, showing up tonight, such a lovely evening, um, and for the opportunity to discuss the new fire station. First, I'd like to touch base on the fire station's move from downtown to its present location. Then I would like to talk about some of our programs and need for improvement, improvements and advancement of these programs. I'll finish up with some talking points on today's uh, building deficiencies. The existing building was built in 1979 and began its use as fire headquarters in May 1980. The 19, in 1980, the 131 Pleasant Street area was mainly residential with very little commercial development. 
Over the past 30 years, there has been a considerable increase of commercial development in the area. We now have restaurants with takeout food, more gas stations, banks, retail shops. Today, there is construction of a larger capacity supermarket and a larger boys and girls club. <clears throat> this has contributed to, to an increase uh, of vehicle and pedestrian traffic in intersections uh, in, in the area that were once free of congestion and now heavily burdened with traffic and gridlock, mainly in the summer months, resulting in impeding emergency vehicles responding to calls. The fire department building was constructed for a 1980s demand for service. The day the fire department moved into the new, new building, uh, Bruce Watts was fire chief. Chief Watts at, the t at that time stated the building was at full capacity. The uh, department had less permanent personnel dealing with a much lower call volume. In 1979, when the fire station was under construction, the annual, annual town report stated that the fire department responded to 570 emergency calls. In the upcoming annual town report of 2014, the fire department responded to 2,869 calls with an additional 2,114 service and inspection calls. As expected, the island's growth over the past 30 years, call volumes have increased considerably. The fire department faces a similar situation today as it did in 1979. That is moving from an undersized property and building located in a densely built up downtown area to a less congested area. We are now in, in that situation again. This time it's important to make sure the new facility is designed and built to sustain the department's staffing, future programs, programs like advanced life support for ambulance service, improve wildland firefighting capability, improve fire protection for out of the hydrant districts that have no municipal water supply, and addressing adequate space needs for training. These programs involve the purchasing of new, new equipment, apparatus, as well, increase in staffing. I'd like to give a quick review of these programs starting with, the, with our ambulance service. The ambulance service we have now is a basic life support service. Since 1980s and the 90s, this service has improved with upgrades in new te te technology like automatic defibrillation, moving to newer technology, several times improving shock applications, blood monitoring for oxygen, carbon monoxide, and blood glucose levels, administering medications such as epinephrine auto-injections, nasal Narcan, oral glucose, and a butyrol updraft for respiratory issues. Today there's a lot more that takes place in back of the ambulance than did 30 years ago. All of these advancements improving the patient's quality of care early into the event. We are now a basic life support service and need to upgrade to advanced life support service. We move <clears throat> when we move to an advanced life support service, a few examples of improvement in patient care are cardiac monitoring with manual defibrillation, intravenous applications of administrating medications for pain management, diabetic cardiac and respiratory issues. Medications through IV administrations can stabilize a patient faster, enhancing the quality of care early into the event. We have some catching up to do in the quality of patient care. There are five emergency medical service regions in the state of Massachusetts. Nantucket is in Region 5. Region 5 covers the Cape and Islands moving towards New Bedford and the Lakeville area. We are the only basic life support ambulance service left in Region 5. Other ambulance services are licensed at an advanced life support level. The public's expectation of an ambulance service today is of an advanced life support ambulance service. To accomplish this, additional positions and equipment are needed, such as an emergency medical services officer. It's a position that needs to be in place to move forward with an advanced life support program. This position will be responsible for scheduling training and certification needs of department personnel. Right now, there are national certifications in curriculums that need to be completed annually. Moving forward, these standards will increase considerably. The department has a need for a fourth ambulance. This is due to the increase in call volume and co concurrent calls with higher fluctuation in the summer months. There, there has been a growing request for dedicated ambulances for private and public special events. Medical services are required to be on location at these events due to the large number of people attending and the nature of these events. In the summer months, it is not unusual to have all three ambulances out on call. So this makes it difficult to give up one ambulance to cover these events. 
The fire department needs to improve its wildland firefighting capability and improve fire protection in the out, uh, out of hydrant districts. The intent of this program is to protect the properties outside of the hydrant district. Even with the expansion of the municipal water system, there is still a considerable amount of remote areas that need fire protection. This can only be achieved through a program designed to deliver water to, to these remote areas. This year, the fire department has started designing and investing in larger capacity tanker trucks. These new tank tankers will shuttle twice the amount of, amount of water. The old tankers have 1,000 gallon carrying capacity. The new tankers will have 2,000 gallon carrying capacity. These tankers are larger and need to fit in an already tight ap apparatus space. The old tankers are two-wheel drive and occasionally get stuck responding to hard-to-reach areas. This happens when shuttling water to uh, homes positioned in diff difficult locations, making our job much more challenging. We have the same problem responding to brush fires. A good amount of uh, brush fires start near homes or developments that are in close proximity of heavy brush. The new tankers will have four-wheel drive, be able to carry more water and have better pumping capability. This results in a le less water transport time and water shuttle rotations. It allows for delivering larger capacity of water to difficult locations without getting the tankers stuck. Additional equipment we need is a brush breaker. The new fire station will have a space designated for a brush breaker. This is a type of engine that's designed for difficult terrain, specifically for wildland firefighting. The vehicle can drive through moderate brush for the purpose of flanking a, wild, a wildfire to extinguish it or redirect it. Fire department retired the old brush breaker in 1996. This was due to the vehicle's constant maintenance issues until it was not serviceable. This happened because we did not have the space inside to properly house the engine. With, a, with large areas of heavy brush close to homes, this is a piece of equipment that's badly needed. Training space needs. Uh, training has always been a concern with the Nantucket Fire Department, mainly to keep the <coughs> firefighter citizens and visitors safe. Therefore, it's imperative for the EMTs and firefighters to have access to a facility that's adequate, that, with adequate training space. We don't have that today. The majority of the tr training consists of fire hazardous material and EMS training that should take place on a daily basis. All of these skills diminish if not practiced regularly. Large amount of the training is practical evolution, such as structure fire search and rescue, ground ladder operations, and rope rescue techniques. There is no safe structure or space in today's apparatus room to practice these evolutions. Academics are a large part of the EMS and hazardous material training, requiring classroom space at a minimum of 35 to 40 students. Right now we have room for 12 to 15 students. The new building needs to have the capability of supporting the department staffing programs and services well into the future. The building that we are in today was evaluated in 2008 by Mitchell Associates architects who specialize in emergency service facilities, specifically fire departments. There were a number of deficiencies found, and I would like to list a few of them. General overall building issues. The building does not meet local, state, federal code regulations and does not provide for safe exiting or accessibility for the handicap. There's no sprinkler system and no security system. The building has environmental and health problems, such as rodents, insect, and mold issues. Existing station is energy inefficient. The apparatus bay is too small. It's not safe for housing the current engines, ambulances, and firefighters on staff. There is no safe area for putting on or taking off the turnout gear while firefighters are responding to emergency calls. Uh, there is no adequate storage rooms for turnout gear, medical supplies, hoses, equipment, or contaminated items. There's no proper decontamination uh, or laundry facility area for firefighters or EMTs to deal with chemicals and blood-borne pathogens, making it difficult to not spread contaminants through the building. We need space to re-equip the engines and ambulances inside to get them back into service after fire and EMS calls. There's no place to perform maintenance on the engines and ambulances. Clearance between the engines and ambulances in some areas is only 20 inches. And by standards, should be eight-foot clearance between all emergency vehicles. The crew quarters are inadequate for the number of staff or gender. Quarters lacking in bunk space, kitchen, and bathroom facilities. Building has no dedicated female fire firefighter quarters. In 1979, when the crew quarters were designed and built for two full-time firefighters, 
Today we are at five full-time firefighters. The administration office space is too small and inadequate to efficiently run operations. Office spaces are undersized. In some cases, offices are six foot wide by 14 foot long and not manageable for good work production. There is no conference area or space to discuss business or confidential issues privately with the public. Fire alarm superintendent and fire prevention offices are undersized and located on the second floor. This does not meet codes for handicap accessibility. And the secure re record storage rooms are too small. The volume of required records to be stored has exceeded storage capacity. Solving these issues and moving forward, Nantucket Fire Department will provide citizens and visitors of this island with a higher quality of pa patient care and an improved fire protection of properties. I'd like to continue this presentation by handing it over to Neil Patterson. Neil, Neil can inform everyone on further areas of discussion that have taken place over the past year with the new fire station work group. All yours. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking the Civic League for hosting this. Um, in November of 2013, the Board of Selectmen established the new, station, new, new fire station work group. The work group's directive was to review the existing plans for a new fire station at 4 Fairgrounds Road, review the feasibility of other potential sites, including smaller satellite stations, and review the feasibility of expanding the fire station at the current site. The Board of Selectmen appointed work group members from the Capital Committee, Finance Committee, Board of Selectmen, and three citizens at large. The group spent 15 months in discussion, evaluating options that were potentially reachable, and sp specifics discussed were, to start with, uh, we evaluated the existing floor plans, evaluation of the existing floor plans. This involved discussions of the square footage needed for present department operations and future department programs and growth. Programs like the ambulance service upgrade, better fire protection for the island, and training needs for the department. As a world-class resort community with a large seasonal population that pays a majority of our taxes, ex expectations exist that we provide medical care in the form of advanced life support that reflects the reality of 2015. We also looked at the existing floor plans for the new fire station, which have incorporated space to help solve these issues. The work group then evaluated, evaluated other potential building sites. In addition to the current fire station location, other locations that were evaluated for the new fire station included the water company property located on Milestone and Old South Road, hospital property on Prospect Street, Four Fairgrounds Road, and the old police station property on South Water Street. Then we looked at the renovation of the existing building. The concerns to the limitations and restrictions of the size and layout of the new building's footprint were discussed concerns of present and future progression of commercial businesses and buildings in the immediate area were discussed. The level of construction required to reconstruct was evaluated. The new fire station's location today presented concerns about what to do with the fire department for a period of two years while the present building was under construction. This would require a temporary move of the department and there is no other location that will work or budget in place to accomplish this. <coughs> We then looked at the potential of smaller satellite stations. The operations of several smaller satellite stations on Cape Cod was reviewed and how this has the potential on the island. Included in the discussion were locations in the downtown area, Sconset area, and the Cliff Road area. There was extensive discussion regarding the need for additional staffing with implementation of satellite stations. It was decided by the work group that a continued effort is needed for further study in the department's emergency response. This was followed up with the Worcester Polytech Institute group spending months evaluating seven years of the department's emergency response data, resulting in a very in-depth report supporting the work group recommendations. Our final recommendations include Number one, the fire station work group concludes unanimously the existing fire station has been functionally obsolete for many years and that the new fire station is a high priority. The building capacity has been surpassed and this does have impacts on firefighter safety. After careful review, 
the work group's recommendation to the Board of Selectmen is to build a new fire station on the location at 4 Fairgrounds Road, connected to the present public safety facility about there, as we all would know. In addition, for the town to continue the study of de department data to be used for determining the needs of future satellite stations. And there's a few, just two other points I would like to make from which, which I brought from the work group, which was considered important. By delaying this project, it will start to impact our homeowner insurance rates, improved facilities, upgraded equipment, and better fire protection programs bring our insurance rates down by giving us a better national fire class rating. Insurance companies use these fire class ratings to set our rates. We have the potential to keep these rates in check by implementing these, these necessary improvements. Additionally, if we don't go forward, there will be a 3 to 4 percent increase annually in the cost of building a fire station, which in today's costs, that's $450,000 a year to delay doing anything, which is quite a lot of money. Um, and that's where I end. But I would like to pass it over to Peter Morrison to talk about the contributions the Worcester Polytech made, and also actually to thank him for drafting our report, which took a long, long time and many hours in those 15 months, and thank you. Thank you, Neil. I'm just going to take 30 seconds to uh, uh, kind of outline what happened this year with the Worcester Polytech team that uh, worked, happened to be working at the same time that we were working as a work group. And um, I think it's fair to say that uh, what we now have in place, both from this year's work and going forward, because I know there's going to be future uh, teams, is kind of a de facto in-house analytic unit for the department where these people basically assemble all the data, put it together in a way that can be applied to uh, decisions that will have to be made in the future. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a great benefit uh, to all of us, especially to uh, the chief going forward, to have this information. Uh, we're already looking at how one could go about evaluating uh, possible sites five, ten years from now for a satellite station if that were needed. So that's just by way of saying we've, we've got – we're making use of the data in a way it was never used before. Um, Finally, I'd like to call on Rick Atherton to offer an alternative perspective on the new fire station. Rick? Peter, thank you. Um, my comments tonight are, are my own. They do not represent the thoughts of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, the Board agreed to put the uh, fire station capital item on the warrant. Uh, to my knowledge, the Board has not acted to officially support or recommend that article to town meeting by a vote. Usually that does not take place until the finance committee has made its own recommendation and then the board goes through and decides whether it wishes to comment or specifically on any specific item. I think you've heard clearly uh, why the need for a new physical facility is there and I don't disagree with that. My concern though has more to do with a uh, the response time and some of the goals of the department and really much of the information that's come forth from the WPI study. Uh, so to, to sort of lead into that, a couple things. If you go to the town's website for the fire department, the goals include to provide response times within nationally accepted standards. And you go then down to the new fire station work group recommendations and they have short range, which really is the building of the building, and long range, which includes identify, identify options for maintaining and improving <clears throat> the Nantucket Fire Department's response time metrics and resilience as the island grows and evolves. And then you might turn to the executive summary of the WPI students themselves, and it's interesting to go to the response time issue. As I recall the statistics presented to the uh, town, our current response times um, meet our goals about 40 percent of the time. And uh, the question in my mind is whether that's an acceptable uh, target to have. And just to report, for example, uh, a comment in the executive summary from the WPI students. 
When looking at a map of high response times, we expect to see the majority of those calls on the outer edges of the island, but this was not the case. The most significant factor was traffic during the summer, which causes high response times to a emergencies close to the station and in the downtown area where a majority of the calls occurred. We found that 40% of non-concurrent calls with a response time of 10 minutes or higher during the summer fell close to the roads deemed highly congested. And my concern here is that I think um, we need to address right now the issue of over our overall strategy to how to provide fire and ambulance services on an adequate basis for a community that's grown substantially. And in that regard, to me, response times is an integral part of that strategic plan. The fire station work group and the chief and others have worked very hard at understanding the physical nature of a new facility. I think it's time, as we agree to spend $15 million on such a facility, that we more openly uh, address and deal with the question of response time. Satellites might be a, an answer. There might be other answers. But I would hope that we develop a plan that specifically addresses how we, how we anticipate we can improve our response time, our response time issue. Um, one of the things that hit me during this process of listening to the uh, comments is that it seems to me the one area of our community that has the highest risk of fire and is irreplaceable are the old historic homes Nantucket has. And to be practical, those new homes outside the downtown area are, are not in the same situation. And um, I think we need to have a program and a commitment by the town and the fire department that makes sure our response time in dealing with any emergency in the old historic district can meet the response targets. They are not replaceable. So it, the, the risk profile for those homes is very different from the risk profile in other homes in our community. So my uh, alternative comments, as Peter phrases them, trying to figure out how we address my thoughts, is that we need to make sure that the plan we're embarking on accomplishes that. And I might ask, for example, in moving the station from the current location to the new location at four fairgrounds, is response time anticipated to be improved or the same, or is it going to be a little less in some areas? Um, traffic uh, and the problems we have in getting downtown and around downtown to the other side are not getting any better. Um, we have more houses, more cars, so I think that issue is not going to go away. So my request here is really that I would hope the town administration and the fire department deal with a more specific plan as to how we can improve our response time for both ambulance and fire protection for the community. So, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, Mark, did you want to answer the specific question that uh, Rick posed about response times between the existing station and the uh, proposed new station? I don't recall offhand, but... I have a recollection of it. Uh, no, we, what we did is we did a, a very simple study in the beginning for response times um, for locations. That we presented that to the board. That, that was by a smaller private company, and it was a quick study. And this, this location, the hospital location, water company location, they were all used, and it didn't show a big difference in the response times. That study was done by mile per hour. They did, they did the timing for 25 miles per hour, 35 and 45. And I, and I don't disagree with anything that um, um, Mr. Atherton's talk, talking about. The, on, the only thing that we're trying to do as a fire department, and this, this is what's really important with the uh, Worcester Polytech study, is that that's a partial study. It need, we need to go deeper into it. Because even though 40% of our, our response times are within national standards, the problem is our <coughs> ambulance, ambulances and fire engines are not equipped with the amount of personnel to make national standards. So in other words, when, an ambu when we have three firefighters working and a fire engine goes out for a first initial alarm, it should have five firefighters on it. Most, we're gonna, w many times we're going to have three. So that's how in-depth the study has to go to even evaluate that 40% to make sure that's legitimate. 
<clears throat> and I'd like to uh, take the moderator's prerogative of giving a 30-second answer also, <clears throat> because I think uh, you have raised, you, you have chartered a very important course for the future, Rick, and it goes beyond the immediate question of what are we going to do about the lack of a sufficiently sized uh, facility. Um, it's important to use the data that we have and start to address the questions that you've posed. And I would like to state for the record that um, the Worcester Poly Tech team uh, not only analyzed a lot of data uh, that I thought was worth analyzing, but they actually developed a prototype simulation model that would allow us to answer the questions that you're posing. Um, unfortunately, their term came to a close before they actually could use the model, but they left it there in place for the next team to come in next year. And I fully anticipate that uh, if we sponsor another team next year, uh, we will be able to uh, come up with some fairly robust answers to the question you're posing about how do you delineate the choices that one might want to make between emphasizing, let's say, response times that will work for old historic buildings where, as you say, the risk profile is very different uh, versus uh, improving the response times overall in different parts of the community. There are a lot of choices that can be, that can be evaluated, and I anticipate that uh, about a year from now there will be some answers to those questions that we can all chew over and then start to make, uh, uh, decide which directions we want to go. Um, I've had only one question from hey, Peter, the... Peter, can I just respond yeah, sure. to that a little bit? Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, the, the WPI student information is really quite... Uh, it's available to us. It's, uh, as you say, I think it's going to be usable. And, and one of my concerns is unless we have a strategic plan that starts with our goals and the quality and timely response of our services and sets aside the staffing issue, um, you may not get to the right answer. You know, um, I, for one, would like to feel we have a strategic plan that gets the right answer, and then you decide the staffing levels necessary to implement it, or if not, why not? And uh, I'm concerned that this process, in some elements, has sort of recognized that staffing is an issue, and that became a driver of our decision making. And so I hope that promptly the town will uh, develop an approach that goes the other way. What's the level of services that Nantucket needs to provide? So. Thank you. Um, I've had only one question from the audience, <clears throat> and I'll just read it. It says, in the uh, Worcester Polytech report, it is mentioned uh, several times that the fire station can comfortably respond to two calls at once. Can you explain, I guess this is to the chief, can you explain this in more detail with respect to staffing levels and response times to these calls? Well, I guess the question here is what, do, what exactly does comfortable mean? I think we just covered a, a little bit of that. Um, the, comfortably, uh, the study itself is uh, uh, just based off of calls and times, but the, the, what the study doesn't do when it shows us meeting those calls under a certain time, it doesn't tell us how many people are on that ambulance or how many people are on that fire engine. So even though it's saying we can handle two calls comfortably, those two ambulances may only have one or two um, EMTs on it at the time it shows up for a response time. It could take another five, five, five to seven minutes for call EMTs that um, meet us on scene to make it to that scene. Um, but the data is showing us that the EMTs, the call EMTs and the permanent EMTs that we have out um, throughout the day working their other jobs are coming back fast enough and making short enough times um, to show that second ambulance gets on the air and gets on location within an acceptable time not necessarily acceptable staffing on that. Uh, um, can I go back to your point, Rick, and just ask um, the following question? Um, I personally fully agree with your perspective that we should 
develop a strategic plan or vision of what it is we're trying to accomplish and then see what it implies for everything else. Um, where is the responsibility for formulating that strategic vision? Should there be, should that be vested in some part of town government? Should there be a group that is established uh, to accomplish that? How would you for, how would you well, see Peter, that? Usually, I think uh, you know maybe the board needs to direct the town manager and through her to the fire chief to help develop that. Um, and if they need help in developing that in a more formal way, then they need to ask for it. Uh, whether it's a consultant or a community work group again to deal with that issue, which is a I think I think the work group did a fine job in what they did. Um, I don't think, I, mean, I attended one or two of their meetings, so I have some sense of the flow of the dialogue there. Um, I think they felt, uh, my observation, Neil can disagree, I don't know if I would use the word constrained, but their priority was looking at the building, not looking at the vision and the overall strategy for meeting the, the uh, fire protection and ambulance <coughs> service needs of the community. So maybe it starts with us. But, you know, it works both ways. Um, each department in the town, I think, is also responsible for developing their own vision of the service level they're trying to provide. And that also comes up through the town manager to the board. So it's sort of a little, a little iterative, if you will. I have uh, one other card, which I think is more a statement of opinion than a question. I'll just read it. It says, for Atherton, Response time is solely one factor. The chief, I can't quite read it, uh, something about safety, space, housing, training. Response time is the small issue. I think this is a, an opinion. I don't know if there's anybody who wants to um, comment on that. Um, yeah, you know, I, th I think the town is more than capable of meeting both those goals and objectives. They're not, you know, it's not a one or the other issue, Peter. So. Um, I'm just thinking of how we put these two points of view together, and it seems to me that uh, one way it could work next year is if the town could get a start on formulating the strategic vision and a vision that, while it may not be finalized a year from now, certainly would delineate or identify the key choices that would emerge, like are we prioritizing the older historic buildings downtown, which are basically, in many cases, uh, much more vulnerable to fire, uh, are we uh, prioritizing uh, advancing the so-called mini hospital on wheels that would uh, that we would have uh, transitioning from uh, basic ambulance service to advanced life support some of the some of the choices that we have to make and if those choices were clarified by next October, I think the Worcester Polytech students could go to work with uh, using the analytic tools to flesh out what the possibilities are and what the trade-offs are. I see uh, this analytic unit as being able to provide the objective facts that would lead to an informed way of going forward once the value choices are made. So I'll just leave it at that. That's how I would like to see it work. And since we're apparently right on schedule, contrary to what I'd thought. Um, we're going to move on to the second topic area, which is the proposed new school, and we will hear first from Superintendent Cozart. Thank you. <clears throat> With your indulgence, um, we have a PowerPoint that uh, we thought might help our, our viewers, um, both those that are here tonight in the storm and um, those that are at home. Thank you to the Civic League, um, Alan Reinhardt, President, for inviting us, and Peter Morrison as, as moderator. We appreciate this opportunity to talk about the need for a new school as well as um, to discuss our plan for the new school. The, the story of the um, new school and the need for a new school is really a, a study of the enrollment increases um, in, in the past years. And uh, if you would go to the enrollment. Mike, I'm going to see the screen better from out there. It's so fine. Thank you. Excuse me. There have been um, three studies of the needs, the space needs in the school district in the last, uh, since 1999. 
1999, NESDEC, the um, New England School Development Council, came in, looked at the schools, <clears throat> and said that um, we needed more space in the elementary school. In, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. In 2008, um, the TBA architects came in again and looked at the schools and determined that we needed more space in the schools. And again, a, um, an existing condition study was done in 2014 by Castle Boos Associates. And so the, the consistent theme among those three studies is that we needed space in the elementary and middle school. I think that if you were to look at the enrollment figures um, and look at the growth over the last five years, this is a 20-year shot um, snapshot of enrollment. And you can see that we've gone from 1,000 students in 1993-94 to 1,557 students um, this year. But in the last five years, we have had a 26% growth in the population in the school district. Um, we determined that we would have a, another demographic study and uh, brought in um, two um, well-known members in the uh, demographic world um, named McKibben and uh, Cropper. And they determined that our population enrollment will continue to rise through the year 2020 and then um, will level off and perhaps decrease slightly um, in the years after that. When I looked at coming down to Nantucket, I was doing my homework and looked at the population. Um, the enrollment from 19, um, uh, excuse me, 2007-8 to 2010 and you can see highlighted in the yellow that the population decreased in those four years. And I remember saying to my wife, well, at least uh, I wouldn't have to build a new school. And since that time, in the last five years, we've gone from 1233 to 1557. Um, that's an increase of a little over 325 students in that time, which in and of itself is a school. When you add that to an already overcrowded elementary school, um, and our elementary school this year in October had 725 students um, for a school that was built arguably for 500 or 550, um, we have added four modular classrooms. And um, I don't think that Nantucket um, wants an elementary school that is getting up near the highest um, enrollment of any elementary school in the Commonwealth. And we certainly, um, I believe, don't want to serve our children in modular classrooms. Um, it is a finger in the dike, and it is time for us to move forward with a permanent solution. So to that end, um, we conducted a community-wide forum last April and had um, members of teachers, um, administrators, parents, um, some school committee members, and residents. We had senior citizens on that um, forum, and it was determined that the best path to go would be to build a new three through five, grade three through five, what I would term an intermediate school. This has the benefit of um, making our existing um, pre-K, uh, existing Nantucket Elementary School into a pre-K through two. And we will show you a few slides as we move forward how um, each sc school population would be served. Um, after determining the what, I think the next question was where. And I'm going to tag team a little bit with Dave Fredericks with the permission of the moderator. Sure. And uh, Dave is going to take you through um, the work of the building committee. If you would go to the next slide, thank you. Um, nope, that's great. That are, those are the members of the building committee. We have between 25 and 30 members that rep represent all um, constituents in the, in the community. And uh, 
it has been a, a terrific group of individuals that have studied this for, say, about nine months now. Um, so after determining what, and that what is to build a new intermediate school, as I mentioned, and in addition to the existing middle school, um, we got into the discussion of where. And I'd like David to take you through that, if I may. Thank you, Mike. Um, as Mike said, I'd like to first thank the Civic League, both um, Alan and Peter, for hosting this. Um, I'd also like to thank Mark, um, uh, the leadership needed here to, to get us to focus on the need for that fire station is um, something that I've watched for 20 years. So I, I, I hope that the town pays attention to what our chief has to say. Um, I, I would start off by saying, you know, w what Mike brought up is there are 25 people that have broad island experience that have participated for about nine months, along with the support of some experts. Uh, I would ask you to stop for a second and think about the elementary school first, realizing that we're close to 200 children beyond what it was originally designed for. When this, when this group got together, what we focused on primarily were trying to agree on Rick's point. What is our strategy and what are our goals? And I, I thought what I would do is simply list them at the higher level without getting into all the detail of each one and then take you through why we think the location and the proposed design that we have meets those to the best of our ability. First and foremost, in, in all schools, it is um, the safety of our children. It is the efficiency of the overall school itself. That's, that's cost and use of the facilities, all of those types of components. It's the flexibility to meet what the school needs today with some forward thinking about how and what we design and how it may be flexible for a changing future. Uh, the next had to do with building on what we know. Our elementary school has gotten many awards. It works off a very specific design. We tried to take what we know about that and build it into what we thought was the solution. We further looked at the success we had at our high school and middle school where we have a campus-like feel and where high school students can interchange with middle school, the parents can have limited drop-off, and we, we tried to build that into our discussion. Um, we wanted to minimize, and this is really critical, we wanted to minimize the impact to the community. We wanted to minimize the impact to the school and to the students. Um, we, we wanted to provide some level of traffic improvement. We wanted to mostly improve the experience to the students that attended our school. We felt that it was important for every student that they had a positive experience going through the school. So when you think about those, the, the design on the wall that is up right now, hope, hope I'll take you through how come we came up with this particular de design given those goals and objectives. Now the, the idea here is if you notice uh, in the far right hand corner, the new school ends up in the southwest corner in what is the parking today. The idea here is that we're allowed to end up with two distinct drop-off and pick-up points. The first is for buses, and the second is for parents. By breaking that up, we think we can make it safer and more efficient. The next approach is, when you look at the school, is we want the ability for the two schools to stay next to each other, both for flexibility, that is, teachers or administrative staff, and or parents can migrate between the two schools in a matter of steps. So if you have children in both schools or you have an issue in both schools, you're able to manage those with limited impact on the movement across this, if you will, small piece of the campus. The next was to take a look at the overall campus flexibility. And when you look at that, we decided that the right answer was to have uh, an interconnecting road and or pathway for the kids. And the idea here is that children and, again, or administrators can move from one side of our school campus now, not the elementary school, but school campus, from one side efficiently to the other. Now, this does a host of things, everything from the Boys and Girls Club to pick up and drop off traffic. The intention is that this will not be open 24 hours a day, that it would be automatic gates and things that would secure its purpose. The design is not done. I'm sure that part of the final design will show there will be a separate pathway built into that for just the kids, separate from vehicles. But once and for all, you'll be able to leave and move across our campus. Now that's important because when you start to think about efficiency, we can share in parking, 
so that if there's an event at the high school or a football game, we can share in that event. If for some reason there is an open house and you want to park and you're a parent who has children in both locations, you can move back and forth across the facility. Um, our children, more than anything, gain from this because they once and for all will have a well-designed means to move between and across the campus. And as we all know, getting to the Boys and Girls Club from the elementary school is a significant issue that we need to improve upon, and the plan built that in as well. When you look at the site, the next thing you should notice is we do not touch any of the existing fields. We do not impact any of the other facilities other than the CPS edition, which I'll talk about separately. So we think that we've been able to accomplish a lot of what we're after. We believe turning the school into a campus is that experience improvement for our kids. My children went to school here. I'm very proud of the fact they went to school here. My high school kids, when they were there, went over and read to kids in the elementary school. The elementary kids came over and watched high school sports. All of that is part of this other piece that is not clear to quite to everybody, but we're after that experience that our children are part of a bigger community. So the last is you move over to keeping in mind that there are over 200 children today beyond the design. In the next three years, those children will be moving to the middle school. So in this idea that we're a community, the goal here is to move the woodworking group into a common place where the middle school kids can work with those types of activities with or alongside the high school kids. Not that they'll be in the same class, but they'll be able to share that space. We can take that space, slightly expand it, and have ample room for fractions um, for those kids that will be moving through the system today that are in third and fourth and fifth grade that will be coming over to the middle school. When we look at the project overall, we think we've found a fair way to turn around and achieve all of our goals. There's one point, and, and I talked past it, so I apologize. The school is two floors. That's meant to minimize the footprint. Um, as Nantucket continues to grow, valuing every square foot so that down the road we have not boxed the next generation into not having enough space, we felt the right answer was to go to a second floor. So, Mike, I thought one of the things that would be helpful as well is to just spend a few minutes talking about the inside of the school. Sure. Um, the, the next slide shows you the uh, first floor of the proposed intermediate school. <clears throat> and again, as um, David pointed out, one of the design, the keys to the design is that we wanted the entry to both schools, the existing elementary school and the new intermediate, to face each other and to have common space in, in the middle. <clears throat> so. Um, we do have a gymnasium, we have a media center, cafeteria and kitchen. Um, all of that is in an area that is on one side of the school so that it can be accessed easily in the evening for any programs without having to walk through the school, um, opening up the entire school. On the ground floor would be the um, third grade classroom, so you see a cluster off to the left. Um, and you have seven classrooms around a general classroom cluster. Off of the seven classrooms, you have spaces for um, special education, small group instruction, um, ELL, English language learners, and, um, and you will have the same um, look as you go to the, to the next floor with the fourth and fifth grades. Same sort of configuration with seven classrooms surrounding a large cluster space. That was a very important um, piece that the elementary teachers um, emphasized in terms of providing um, the best instructional practices for the children that we serve. Going back down, um, you, you have, if you'd go back, Diane, thank you. Backspace. Backspace. Okay, good. No, you're on. Uh, I didn't point out the art and the music um, downstairs as well. Um, the design is, is simple. I think the challenge in the design, as it is any time that you build any municipal building, is how to build it large enough without making it too large. Um, based on enrollment projections, we have built in some flexibility um, 
this school should be able to handle 400 to 450 students. As you can see, that there are uh, it's about 72,000 square feet, and as Dave pointed out, it's on a um, on two stories so that it can fit the footprint and allow for what we might want to do um, 10 or 20 years from now, depending on the enrollment in the school. I would like to just to go through two renderings. These are um, were not in the design. Um, phase of this building, but these are renderings to show you what it might look like. Um, this would be the front, and as I'm standing in the Nantucket Elementary School uh, bus circle, this is looking over to what I would see at the intermediate school. Next slide, this is the back of the school that would have a, a patio outside the cafeteria and outside the library media center to the, to the right of that. I think this is important. I, I want to just show you the interior of the um, middle school briefly. This is what David was alluding to. Um, if you could circle what is now the industrial arts or building trades area in the back of the school, we would be moving that into the vocational wing of the high school. And um, that would allow us to add six classrooms so that our enrollments of 120 and 130 that are now in our kindergarten and first grade and will be rolling through the elementary school and hitting the middle school, we will be prepared um, for those numbers when they arrive there in four or five years. Um, the other thing that I think it's important to point out, if you look at the existing Nantucket Elementary School, that school um, stands to, to gain a lot as well from having an inter intermediate school. It will serve pre-K through second grade. Um, it is a, a highly likely, uh, a high likelihood that we will have universal preschool in five years. It could happen sooner, um, but I think it's certainly a political agenda of, the, of both parties. And uh, there's a lot of money out there right now for um, preschool education. At this point, we do not service all of our preschoolers. Um, we serve the special ed pre preschool op um, population and a very small percentage of the regular ed preschool population. Um, if we have universal preschool, we will need six or seven classrooms, and this um, project allows us to serve those children. It also allows us to move the community school and the early childhood center, which has been moved out of the high school and has no home today, to move in to the um, near the entrance of the existing elementary school. That makes perfect sense. The early childhood center serves children from birth to through age four. And um, it makes a lot of sense to um, our building committee and administration to have those children first come into the school that eventually they will be attending. Um, and as well, the community school will have space. Depending on enrollment, the um, central office, the superintendent's offices, will also be in this school. Um, this summer, my offices will be moving out of the high school so that um, we provide two more classrooms to the growing population at the high school. Um, I have tried to point out um, in many meetings that we don't just have an elementary school enrollment problem. Um, we have an enrollment that is impacting all of our children. And so we need a solution that is going to um, provide space. So. Our offices will be moving out. We're, we're looking for either rental space. Um, so I'll put a plug in there if anybody knows about uh, 2,000 square feet that's available. Um, we're looking for that. Or we will be moving into a modular classroom ourselves. It makes sense for my office to um, be in a modular or in rental space rather than having students, high school students, going in and out um, of the high school. So 
this um, project really should provide a, um, a solution for the space needs in all of our schools. Having said that, if we continue adding 75 to 100 students every year, um, we have to be thinking about what's going to happen 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And that was foremost in the minds of the building committee as they developed the site plan so that we will have um, the room for future growth. And I, I thought maybe that uh, Dr. Lepre would like to follow up from here, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. The school committee's position is that this is a needed program to enlarge our schools. Uh, when my daughter graduated from the high school, there were 47 children in her class. We are now having classes coming through of 120, 130, and we have to respond to that need. It's extremely important, I feel, and I think the committee feels, to have a tremendous emphasis on those early grades, to have the smallest classes possible so that we can do the best job possible. We have to respond to this. I would remind people that not that many years ago, the high school was way too large. Well, right now we're about to uh, kick our superintendent out and the administrative offices because the high school is not too large. So I think as times have changed and as birth rates have increased, I will tell you at the hospital, we have to respond to that need and I think the way to do it is uh, with the intermediate school and with the addition to the middle school. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I don't have any questions submitted from the audience, so I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative and fire off some of my own. Um, <clears throat> it, one question, I guess, uh, for Michael, this is kind of a setup because I think I know the answer. <laughs> Where are all of these entering students coming from who are entering at the, uh, at the uh, younger grades? I'm, I'm not aware of a... Uh, island-wide reproductive renaissance that's occurred uh, that would that would drive that would be driving this I know that could be part of it but is there anything else going on that you want to comment on no, I, I think that's a great question um, there are, are people who think that the um, enrollment increase is simply um, uh, an immigrant population an EL pop, ELL population and it's not um, of the 325 students that have come in in the last five years, um, you know, around 100 might be ELL students. Um, that still leaves two-thirds of that group that are coming in. I think it's a direct relation to the economy improving. And um, in, in 2007 and 2008, I understand we had um, families leaving the island because um, there wasn't work on here. Um, and uh, many of those have returned and others have come as um, that has happened. Um, have you seen any indication that the school is enjoying higher retention rates over time, uh, quite apart from the economy? In other words, are we looking at um, what I've characterized before as the failure of success, which is the school is doing such a good job that People are not coming and going, they're only coming and they're staying. Well, I, I think there are two um, answers to that. First of all, I think the community has done a great job of expanding the tourist season. Um, I think at one point we were, uh, the tourist season was probably, um, what, late May through um, August, and I think expanding it to, um, you know, starts at the end of April now and arguably goes through. November and into December, and um, families, instead of leaving, um, say that they can make ends meet in those, you know, January, February, March. So I think that that's one of the answers. I think um, certainly the the uh, success of the uh, Nantucket High School and our students who are um, graduating from the high school and going on to terrific um, colleges and universities. Uh, I think that is a piece. Our the number of students who are going off to private school for high school have been reduced. 
Um, so I think that that's a, a product which actually leads me to one other comment, and then I'll answer uh, the other questions that, that are coming. Um, we have two private schools on island that serve students K through 8, and I'm thankful for those two private schools because if we were to add the over 200 students um, to our existing um, space needs, I, I, I'm not sure that we could could do it. So, um, um, uh, here's Peter, a question. Yeah, can, can I add one more thing to that? Sure. Uh, I, I think um, Dr. Lepre's answer actually is kind of an interesting anecdotal support to that. Some 47 people graduated when Mary graduated, and, and here we are 15 years later, and we expect to graduate at 120. Uh, and I think you'd find out that's proportionally higher than the number of kids that are in the elementary school has grown. And so it's certainly an indicator that there are more kids who are willing to stay with us through the entire program. And um, it's certainly been my experience as I watched my own kids go through that each year the number of kids graduating were going up seemed, at least as an observation, that they were going up faster than the kids were coming in the front door. So you're, uh, you're providing a better product, basically, a better education than might have been the case in the past and, and more people are... are uh attracted to it. You know, I, I think, to be fair, I think Nantucket High School students have always performed well and, and gone to good schools. I think that um, we, we are trying to build upon that. Um, we have challenges, um, but I think the successes in the last um, three or four years have been significant. And, and I would say that we are just as proud um, of the student who goes to um, maybe the first in their family to go to college. Um, so this isn't all about Harvard and, you know, Dartmouth and um, Georgetown. It's, it's when that student who's the first in their family goes to college. That's a, that's a wonderful success for our schools. We have a question from the audience. Will we need to build an enlarged high school in another five or ten years? I don't think that we will need to do that in the next um, five to ten years. But uh, um, beyond that, I think that that, that could be a question. Um, we do have right now, if you, if you looked at the enrollment page, this year's senior class is 101 students. The junior class is 125. The sophomore class is 135. Now, um, that usually dwindles from freshman, sophomore year to the senior year a little bit. But those numbers are, are significant. The numbers that are coming in, fortunately we have a, some aberrations like a, um, a, a sixth grade class of 94 that allows um, for those numbers. So I, I think we're going to be okay for the next five to ten years. After that, um, you know, I, I think that there's a concern. In my mind, um, we may need to build a new school. It would probably be a new middle school and make the existing high school, middle school, into, a, into one high school because the, the dollars are cheaper um, for building a new middle school than a new high school. But I think that will be determined, you know, 10 years plus out. Uh, just following up on that a bit, I know that um, <clears throat> all the research shows that uh, universal pre-K is probably the best investment that a nation can make in its human resources, and um, you've opined that it's probably going to happen, which means that there's going to be federal money or state money or both providing students with the necessary resources to have that, and that, that I assume is going to be uh, an impetus for more enrollment growth other, beyond what is now forecast. We don't have that in the forecast, but if you're a betting man, would you, uh, would you bet that there's probably going to be not so much a leveling off, but perhaps another boost if and when that happens? I, I, I agree, um, and certainly we're talking more um, when we're getting into demographics. We're in an area that you're far more comfortable than I am. Um, with your experience, but I, I think that we will have that leveling off. Um, I think that Nantucket has always shown that it's rebounded 
from the um, any economic downturn. And when that rebound hits, you know, we could level off today and we need that new school. We already have <laughs> the 725 students, so... Um, you know, we need a school of 300 today, not based on tomorrow's numbers. Right. Uh, <clears throat> there's another question. I'm not sure that anybody here can give a very thorough answer because it's really a question that is going to be addressed in the second forum, but I'll throw it out for anybody who wants to take it up. Will you explain in more detail the financing costs of these projects? Um, we do have a... Um, a slide, and David, I don't know if you wanted to um, take them through it. I wasn't sure how much time we would have. I wanted to be respectful of um, the Civic League, but um, David, I'll let you take that. Before I go through it, um, I, I want to simply say that understand that we have just completed the preliminary design of the school, that there is an RFP, a request for a pricing and proposal, out for the final design. Um, however, we took our role pretty seriously, understanding that the timeline of this project was such that the need was today, and we had to have some level of comfort that our number was um, th the right number, if you will. Uh, so when you build one of these, and, and in my previous life I spent a fair amount of time in, in larger projects, the, the components that people often forget about include design and engineering, um, licensing and permitting, finance, um, and the overall project contingency approach. And so when you think about those components, I want you to think about the fact that if we look at just the construction of the facility, not including some of the miscellaneous site improvements that we talked about to turn things into a campus, the overall project budget would be about $36.6 .6 million. But again, when you look at what it costs to design one of these today, to finance one of these, to do the licensing, and to do all the other miscellaneous site improvements, the ultimate budget turns into the $44.8 million. Uh, so as you look at these, there are numbers up on top, and I'll, as everybody wants to turn around and do is jump to the total, but it's important for people to put this in place. The new campus-wide traffic improvements and parking alone are about $2.8 million. And understand, go back to the goals of the committee, when you look at all of the things that are are impacted by growth, we believe this is a cornerstone of turning the campus into an all-in-one support for um, all of the schools, not just the elementary school. The parking is a perfect, the very simplest example. Every one of us here, and I always use the football game as the easiest thing, but it, but it could be a play at night. It could be all kinds of events that happen at the high school. The high school doesn't have adequate parking. To build adequate parking for the high school and then go and build adequate parking for the elementary school would be a, 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 a sin in, in, in the lack of forward thinking in ways that we can share these resources. If you go back to the site plan, David, I'll, I'll um, just want to point something out. Um, one, of the, one of the areas, thank you, Diane, is a parking area that would increase our parking considerably. There are 177 spaces in that area that would not only serve um, faculty and the elementary school, but would serve as event parking for the middle and high school. And anybody that's gone to December Delight is the one that I think of. Um, and, and you're right, a, a basketball game or a swim meet. Um, voting. It, it's voting. Um, it's very definitely a problem. So I just wanted to point out that parking and the fact that um, we are trying to take traffic off of Surfside with this plant. And it's been one of the nice things about having Andrew Vorse and Mike Burns on the uh, steering committee who have helped us try to um, minimize the traffic that comes back on Surfside and that would eventually get clogged at Surfside and Sparks. So, so taking that even further, if you notice, which is not a cost to the town, it's a relationship for the town, is even the ice rink parking. One of the other advantages to this, if you will, cross-campus drive, is the idea that that parking is even more overflow parking. We have been in conversations with, with those folks. They are, they are and have been in the past willing to work with us and do the right thing for the town. So again, you've got to keep thinking that you know, that $2.8 million is, is about a holistic solution for bigger than just the schools, but the community at large. So if you can jump back to the budget. Uh, 
Uh, the, the next, when you look at the, the next one, I'm just going to bring these down as you come along the side. Uh, the new school and the additions. One of the things that people forget about is you have to furnish them, you have, to, you have a fair amount of testing related to them. These are all the ancillary things that are associated with a building. And when you're talking about you know, the square footage and the complexity of what's going on today, it's an additional $1.2 million. The CPS addition is $3.7 million. This is the physical construction associated with the property. Uh, you jump over to the far right side and you have the, the, uh, the um, the addition and the management and the licensing. So I talked about what does it cost to design and license one of these. That is to get all of the permits, to line up all of the design to the standard needed to be able to put things out to bid in today's world. It's approximately just shy of $5 million in today's world. And then the last, of course, is the, is the, is the biggest single expense, which is the $30.2 million associated with the construction of the school. Now, one of the things that we did is we, we didn't stop with the idea of, of, of what we could do internally. We did our own homework. We did a fair amount of research on what are average prices. We built in Nantucket factors, and we came up with a general ballpark of what we thought as a group that the, the school might cost. We went out and we uh, have looked at what previous programs have cost in the, in, in the town of Nantucket in recent years. We are at those costs. We are, we are plus or minus dollars within the cost of what we've recently spent on other projects. We are below what the state recommended as a final price per square foot. But, but again, those were all just indicators. We took the contracting firm that helped us build this and asked them to produce an estimate. And then lastly, to get some comfort that, again, we had a good handle on, on pricing, we asked them for a third-party outside engineering firm to provide us with a cost. So when we look at the number, um, although it's still a preliminary design, and, and we believe we have flushed out the kinds of things that can change the number significantly, we have a fair amount of comfort that the range we're in has been done several different ways, and there's a fair amount of, of comfort that that is a reasonable number for where we are in the process. Good. Um, <clears throat> I'm struck by the uh, kind of the vision that you have here, which seems to me is really a long a long-range one of turning what is a school that has been adapted over time by incremental changes, converting that into the concept of a campus. And I think there are real um, uh, sp uh, spillover benefits to that, and also there is an inherent resilience in the design because uh, you can say we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future, but we, there are a lot of ways we can juggle things around within the campus, as I understand it. And I think uh, I, I personally am impressed by by the thinking that's gone into this. Um, and I'd like to point out that I think it does fit in with the theme of this first forum, which is investing in our future. And this is really um, uh, these are choices that the community can make about how good a campus you want to have, uh, how effective a fire station you want to have, what level of service do you want to have delivered. And uh, this is not a commodity where you say, I, I want a new school, deliver it, it costs X number of dollars, give me the cheapest one you can have, or a fire station that just gets by. Uh, these are dimensions of choice that taxpayers have about how good a facility they want to have, and by my standards, one of the reasons I moved here was because of what I saw, places like the Athenaeum, which in my mind is the best library I've ever been in. And what I see here is a picture of what might be one of the best uh, school campuses one would see on an island in a small community. And I personally would like to see people um, think about the trade-off between how little they might be paying on their tax bill per million dollars for the benefit that they will be getting, not only for themselves, but for the next generation. And so I think we are ending, by my view here, exactly on time, which I'll take credit for, exactly at 6 o'clock. And I thank you for your participation, and I hope that uh, the voters will give serious thought to the issues here and really contemplate and consider carefully the choices that we've outlined, because there are choices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.